Hi there, welcome to this week's lab at home vlog, back in my kitchen doing molecular biology from home. So this week I've got quite a lot of um, sporting activities going on outside of work. So I thought it'd be really interesting to try out the experiment from our B101 kit, which is looking at what version of the athlete gene I have. So just to read a little bit about the blurb from our website, um, I didn't know this, so I'm just going to read what's written here. Um, I'm going to extract DNA from my saliva and then have a look at what variations I have of the ACTN3 gene. This gene encodes the alpha actinin 3 protein which is present in skeletal muscle and is essential for its contraction. So as you know, you get two copies of every gene um, and this gene can be one of two variations. It can have a T allele or a C allele. So the C allele apparently is associated with full power skeletal muscle contraction due to fast twitching muscle fibers, which means the person could be an excellent sprinter. On the other hand, the T allele is associated with more efficient energy disposure due to slow twitching muscles, which means the person could have more endurance. So if you have one copy of each, the C allele is the dominant allele, uh, which means that you'll be the uh, fast muscle twitcher type, the sprinter, rather than the slow muscle twitching, which is the endurance. Um, I'm gonna just take a little bet that I am going to be the T allele, which is more associated with uh, endurance, but let's see what happens, shall we? Right, to get started with the saliva DNA extraction, I've got a little bit of just tap water in there, and now I'm going to add a tiny, oh, oh, tiny bit of salt. Not that much, because <laughs> I will probably be quite ill. Oh. Um, I'm just adding a pinch of salt here and mixing that in. Okay, Ooh. right, I'm now going to um, take a mouthful of that salt water and rinse it around in my mouth just to dislodge the cheek cells um, in my mouth. And then uh, I'm going to spit it back out again. And that's what we're gonna use for my DNA extraction. Okay, here goes. Lovely. Okay, that's um, a very spitty sample. Ooh. <laughs> okay, so now I'm just going to transfer some of that into my microcentrifuge tube. So the microcentrifuge tube is a 1.5 mil tube. So I'm just going to add uh, my spit sample until we're up to 1.5 mil and then just put the rest of that salty goodness to the side. And then I'm going to centrifuge this sample and spin down my um, skin cells from my cheeks uh, to the bottom. And then I'll come back to you when I've got that. Because I had quite a lot of salt water with spit in it and I needed to balance the tubes for the centrifuge anyway, I figured I would um, create another spit sample and just run the DNA extraction in duplicate because it's always a good idea to have two attempts at something. Um, so in the centrifuge now are my two spit samples and I've set it up for um, 4000 G for 90 seconds and I'm just going to set that spinning. So I've now spun down those tubes and my skin cells have collected at the bottom. Um, I'm not sure that this is going to show up particularly well for you on the camera, 
awkwardly there's also a little bit of uh, chocolate Weetabix in there so <laughs> it's a good job that I did it in duplicate uh, because there's only Weetabix in one and not the other so hopefully we are going to extract DNA from um, me and not my breakfast um, so now all I'm going to do is just pour off the supernatant which is the name we give to the liquid um, above the collection of biological matter that is spun down to the bottom so it doesn't have to be um, accurate to get rid of all of it I'm just going to get rid of the bulk of it And then just let the remaining bit of liquid sink back to the bottom. And we now want to resuspend that pellet in um, the liquid that didn't pour off. So all I'm just going to do is tap the bottom until that um, pellet at the bottom of the tube is resuspended. And you can tell that because um, the liquid goes cloudy again rather than being clear. Oh, <laughs> There's actually quite a lot of Weetabix in this sample, so um, that might be a reason why this does not work. Uh, this one's looking a lot better though, so I'll just resuspend that. I'm just going to call this, in fact I'll label these samples, uh, J1 for predominantly gem skin cells and uh, W1 for quite a lot of Weetabix. Good, they're resuspended. So the next step is to put these on the Bento Lab heat block. I'm sure you could all see there that the microcentrifuge tubes that my spit was in uh, were absolutely not going to fit on the PCR heat block. Um, I was just testing, I knew that. So I am just going to pipette those samples across to PCR tubes that do fit on the uh, heat block. <laughs> I have my two replicates on the PCR block now, J1 and W1. So I'm just going to close that lid. And I've already set it up for 99 degrees C at 10 minutes. Um, just set that running. Excellent. Right, my samples have finished heating up now. So I'm going to centrifuge them again. Um, to do this with the PCR tubes, you just want to place it inside a microcentrifuge tube. Uh, I'm just going to reuse the ones that I was using earlier, just to reduce plastic waste. Pop that in there, and then just put them opposite so that the centrifuge is balanced. Just going to actually snap that off, because I don't like it when lids go pinging off. Um, when you're spinning things, which does happen quite often. And then you can hear them rattling around inside the centrifuge. So I don't need those tubes again, so that's fine. I'll just pop that lid down and then set those spinning at 8,000G for 90 seconds. Um, because of the heating step, the, well, my DNA should now actually be free in the supernatant um, rather than trapped in the cell sediment that is spun down to the bottom. So rather than discarding the supernatant this time, um, I'm going to keep that and that's going to be my DNA extraction for the PCR step. So all I'm going to do now is just transfer the supernatant into fresh PCR tubes and then that is ready to go um, for my PCR. Et voila, two, hopefully, human DNA extractions ready to go. Okay, here are my samples ready to go for the PCR. Um, I've shown you that in previous vlogs, so I'm not gonna show you that again. Um, the eagle-eyed among you may notice that I've snuck another sample in here, M2. This is a DNA extraction I did from my spit a couple of months ago for a mammal DNA barcoding workflow using the Hotshot extraction kit. Um, so I'm just going to pop that in there and just see how um, 
well the DNA is going, having been frozen and thawed a couple of times, as well as the ones that I prepared this morning. And then of course I've got the control there with no DNA in, just to make sure that there's no contamination of my master mix. So I'm gonna pop that lid down. I've already set up the PCR program that's required for this workflow. Right, so I'm gonna start that running and come back to it in 92 minutes. Okay, now for the moment of truth to see if my human DNA extractions from spit have worked. So all I've done is just taken the lid off the gel box and I'm just going to move that onto the blue light transluminator. Pop the gel box lid over it, there we go. And then switch the light on. Let's have a little look and see what's going on in here. Oh, look at that. That is some beautiful bands. Okay, we have prime dimer at the bottom, um, but look at those. So both DNA extractions worked. So now we need to have a look at the guide and see what size that band is and see which version of the uh, allele I have for the athlete gene. After I showed you the gel on the light box, I decided to run it for another half an hour just to get the um, ladder uh, to spread out a bit further so I could compare it nicely to our protocol lab picture. So as you can see on the left um, is what we would expect to see from running the athlete gene workflow. Um, and what you're looking for is a control band at 690 base pairs and either the band at 413, which indicates uh, two copies of the C allele, a band at 318, which would cop uh, indicate two copies of the T allele, or a band at each, which would indicate a heterozygous individual with a copy of both. As you can see, I am solidly TT, which means I'm homozygous T, which was the slow twitching muscles associated with endurance, which if you've ever seen me run makes complete sense. So that's definitely not a surprise to me. What we are missing on this gel is the control band at 690 base pairs. Um, done a little bit of reading up about that. And um, it's very likely that this uh, band is either there uh, and is not showing up on the gel because primers and PCRs always favour shorter uh, sizes of amplicons, essentially. So what's probably happened here is that um, a much lower amount of that 690 base pair fragment has amplified um, and it's been overruled by the 300 base pair one. So that is something that we will look into further because we need to adjust the amount of primer that we add to the mix or potentially run it in two separate PCRs so that you always get that control band in addition to your athlete gene alleles. But otherwise, very neat workflow. So it just remains to say thanks very much for listening again. Stay tuned for next week's vlog.